before making any adjustments to the seat and matters chairs, lock the two brake casters at the back of the chair for safety. Once you have completed your assessment and obtained all your critical measures, it's good practice to set the chair up as close to those critical measures as you can. So this would include having the correct seat width, having the correct seat depth, and having the correct seat to footboard height. We can tweak these adjustments when the patient is in the chair, but as I say, it's good practice to have them as close as possible before we put the patient in. Because this is a Sorrento 2, we also have the option of being able to adjust the arm height up and down if we wish, and also adjust the back height up and down if we wish. To make the transfer process much easier, the first thing we need to get right is the sling selection, making sure that it's the right size and the right style for your particular patient. The next really important point is the sling application and making sure that when you have your sling on, that the sling is completely symmetrical, meaning that you have the same amount of sling on each side. If you don't have the sling on symmetrically, you will lift your patient up in a rotated position and that will then make it much harder to get a good position in the chair. Another tip is making sure that you get this loop selection right. So for a loop sling like this, we want to keep it short on the shoulders and keep it long on the legs. That will enable us to get a good seated position and make the transfer into the chair much easier. Another good point before you begin the transfer is to raise the back of the bed up and nearly have your patient in a good seated position. The reason we do this is that it's much more comfortable for the patient to be brought up by the bed rather than being pulled up by the patient lift. When we pull the patient up from flat with the lift, we can actually move the sling out of position, causing the patient to slide down the sling, which can make it much harder to get that good position in the chair. Once you have the back of the bed raised, you can then bring your lift in and connect the loops of your sling onto the hanger bar. To get the best possible position in the chair, it is really good practice to keep the legs of your lift closed as far as they can and push them in between the two wheels of the chair from the side. If you have a bit of tilt in the chair, it makes it much easier to get the patient's hips further back. Then gently pushing the patient's hips back, we can lower the patient into the chair, making sure that we are going in, that the pelvis is nice and symmetrical and as far back as it can go. If your patient lift does not lift your patient high enough to go over the side and over the arm of the chair, another technique commonly used is to open the legs on your patient lift and come in from the front and then at a 45 degree angle. That allows you to get your patient right back and in a good position. Once we have the patient in the chair and we know that their hips are in a good midline position and as far back as we can get them, we can then double check before we take the sling off that we have the seat depth right, the seat width right and the footrest height right. To check the seat width, we'll just run our hands down the inside of the chair just to make sure that we're not too tight. To check the foot plate height, what we want to do is just make sure that the patient's femur is loading adequately on the cushion. We can also check the seat depth here just by putting our two fingers in behind the patient's leg and making sure that we have enough room to do that. If you need to make any further adjustments, the seat width and foot plate height can be adjusted while your patient is in situ. If you need to adjust the seat depth, it is good practice to bring your patient lift in Lift your patient up slightly, that allows you to adjust the seat depth much easier. If your assessment has shown that your patient has limited flexion in the hips and is fixed in posterior tilt, once you have set the back angle up in the chair and are happy with it, it is always good practice to isolate the back recline. So in the Sorrento, we can follow the lever marked recline down to where it attaches into the gas strut. And if we just pull the cable out, that is now the back recline isolated. That means that no one can adjust the back recline by accident, which can have a detrimental effect 
onto your patient's seating position. If you have a powered version of the chair, you can easily isolate the back recline by holding the two backrest buttons together for five seconds until the two lights come on. If you want to reconnect the back recline, hold the two buttons for another five seconds and the two lights will then go out. This is now the back recline reconnected. If your assessment has shown that your patient has limited extension at the knee or tight hamstrings, it is also good practice to isolate the leg elevation, as we don't want anyone to elevate the legs unnecessarily, as this will result in pulling the patient's pelvis forward in the chair, causing them to sit in a sacral position, and this can be detrimental to the patient's seated position. Now that the chair has been fully set up and we have isolated the back recline for this patient, and we've also isolated the leg elevation. We just need to follow that same procedure, making sure that we transfer the patient in a really good position into the chair, and we can then just use the tilt and space. That allows us just to redistribute the patient's pressure and keep him in a really good position.